All right, so I'm going to um, share my screen. And all right, so I just wanted to contextualize this theme of healthy soil and healthy sea. Um, it's these two carbon pools is the way I am framing them for today. We can think about these, these two landscapes in so many dynamic ways. But fundamentally, um, if we think about them for a moment as part of this larger earth carbon cycle, um, we can think about the ocean as this incredible space of life and verdant um, possibility <laughs> um, and necessity for our, our human existence. And just a reminder, the ocean is holding 39 trillion tons of carbon. And it's, uh, that amount of carbon is growing by approximately 2.3 billion tons per year as it absorbs the excess burned fossilized carbon um, from the atmosphere. So remember this carbon pool, um, this beautiful blue ocean carbon pool produces much of the oxygen that we are breathing as we are with each other today, inhaling and exhaling, we have the ocean to thank for that. And we also are acknowledging the role of the soil and the biotic pool, which holds 3.1 trillion tons of carbon. These are the two carbon pools that we humans inhabit um, in different ways, and we directly steward through our connection and dependence to landscapes. This is an image of where we normally hold our symposium. This is Tamales Bay, um, and all this data came from Eric Tonesmeyer's book, Carbon Farming, if you want more information about that. So what we wear, we often think, oh, how do we connect what we wear to climate change? How do we connect what we wear to these carbon pools? So just to frame this up, the global fiber production was approximately 107 million metric tons. Um, this has doubled in the last 20 years. And of that 107 million metric tons of fiber, 62% um, of it is plastic. And as we all know, plastic comes from fossilized carbon sources, comes from the lithosphere, one of the ancient carbon pools on planet Earth. So polyester, nylon, acrylic, spandex, lycra, elastine, these are all fossil carbon derived fibers and they make up the predominant material base for the human wardrobe at this time. This is our second skin and we're literally wearing fossilized carbon as our second skin um, for the lion's share of our, the volume of our wardrobes. So the consumption of plastic fibers was approximately 66.6 6 million metric tons of global fiber production in 2018. So the future of this industry um, is really interesting to me because so many industries are moving away from fossil carbon production. So we see that um, as we divest from fossil fuels, we see our energy sector aiming to make massive transitions we see uh, food packaging, uh, se the sector of the economy aiming to make transitions out of fossilized carbon. But in the textile industry, we actually have um, a, an, a sector of the economy that's still fairly allied with the fossil carbon burning industry. Um, polyester consists of 52% of global fiber production. And as fossil fuels become less economically viable as raw barrels of oil, as raw fracked gas, um, the industry is pivoting to plastics. And so the New York Times posted on this that pivoting to plastics, um, the industry has spent more than $200 billion on chemical and manufacturing plants in the United States over the past decade. In Appalachia, Texas, and nationwide, almost 350 new chemical plants are in the works, according to um, an industry tally. Um, so this idea, and farmers know this well who are listening today, if you have a raw commodity, if you can add value to it, and you can take the margins on that added value, it improves your bottom line. So what we see is the fossil carbon industry moving into plastics and moving headstrong into plastics as the rest of the raw commodity becomes less valuable in a world transitioning to renewable energy. So why do we say the textile industry is still very allied with the fossil carbon industry? Well, it's because we're continuing to promote 
or the industry is continuing to promote plastic fibers as the most ecological fibers. So this is a this is about um, this graph shows the Hig index by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, noting that nylon, acrylic, polyester, everything circled in red, has been measured as having, um, ironically, the lower carbon footprint over natural materials. So we know that design students, um, people in the design community are all getting fed this idea that actually using plastic is more ecological than using biosphere based material. So again, unlike other sectors of the economy, like the energy sector, which is trying to move away from fossil fuels and knows that fossil fuels are more damaging than renewable energy to our climate, you have this industry locking itself in to a commitment, and not only a commitment to fossil carbon-based fibers, but an a actual lifting up of those fibers as an ecological solution. You see this even in the Fashion on Climate report from 2020, this recommendation that if we as a society or multiple uh, societies across the globe are going to stay on what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change calls the 1.5 degree pathway, meaning a pathway that we have a 50% chance of actually making, that every sector of the economy has to change for us to stay within a 1.5 degree temperature increase. Uh, this is, again, a long shot. But to do it, the textile industry is saying they want to increase the amount of recycled plastic in our textiles from 15% to 30%. It's actually part of the pathway, according to the industry. What doesn't get taken into account in these analysis, analyses is that plastic, when we wear it, has all of these unintended consequences and creates a series of externalities that we pay for in our health, our marine ecosystems, and here's just one of those externalities. So where we live in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, they have now termed this, they've created a new term called plastic smog. And this is what's happening in the Bay where we're seeing the lion's share of the microplastic pollution coming from fibers. And these fibers are coming from all these sources, including our textiles. And it's creating literally a plastic smog in our marine ecosystems. So why would we rely so heavily on fossil carbon? It becomes a huge question for me and so many of the members of the fiber shed community who are grassroots organizers, where we are makers, we are farmers, we are ranchers, we are contract grazers, we are a community of people who knows how much natural fiber actually exists. And we know that we are able to sink carbon out of the atmosphere into our working landscapes we know that we can enhance the photosynthetic carbon capture across our landscapes. We have been doing this for some time and I just wanted to give you all today an update on what the North Central California grassroots organizing has been able to do. 56 farmers, ranchers and contract grazers representing stewardship of over 157,000 acres. Um, this is 91% of the land um, that our producer program manages. They have implemented 156 different practices. And just this year, beyond the business as usual photosynthesis, the additional photosynthetic carbon capture, again, we're trying to remove the legacy load of carbon. So we have to do more and we have to do more faster and more better. So this community of land stewards sequestered 4,442 metric tons of carbon into their landscapes beyond business as usual. So we're offsetting around 1,388 round trip flights from New York to London. Uh, I guess during COVID, we don't have a lot of those trips to offset anymore. Not that we are involved in the idea of offsetting. We really need to just keep drawing this carbon out of the atmosphere and creating productive working landscapes. Um, just a reminder, how do we as a grassroots community fit into a larger global vision for solving this crisis through restoring our working landscapes? I recommend the work of Dr. Ratan Lal, who talks about all the unpaved <laughs> remaining breathing land on this planet and its ability to draw down carbon. So basically to sum up this slide, if we get to work and we really do the work to restore landscapes by 2100, 
we have the ability to remove 157 parts per million of CO2e from the atmosphere. Um, this really could bring us down into pre-industrial levels. Imagine every breath you take could be, instead of 413 parts per million carbon, could actually be more like 260, 263. These are levels that didn't exist, um, haven't existed um, in the modern industrial era, but it's possible for us to do this if we restore our landscapes. And so this year's symposium is, a, is, is, is a, again, so many new things <laughs> to explore, but Fibershed has always been an organization focused on place, focused on what we can do where we are. And so in this year, we're reaching farther to explore what are the solutions in our community? Who holds these solutions? And can we diversify the amount of stories and the amount of experiences so that we can aggregate together across the landscape to pull together the most exciting, innovative, brilliant, and inspiring uh, solutions for the crisis that we face. And so this year's symposium explores, again, just a portion of the multitude of fiber systems and natural dye community members, stories and scientific solutions that arise from the land and the people who are currently working in our community, including the inspiration from sister projects. So welcome. I'm so grateful that you are here today um, to listen, to participate, and um, this is what Day one will look like after our fireside chat, just a little reminder. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> I'm going to take a moment to transition us into this very exciting fireside chat. And Dr. Anne, I'm going to introduce you and then we'll get into our conversation. Sure. All right, thank you. All right, so again, excited so excited today. I've been following um, this amazing woman's work for some time now, and um, I will read her bio, which is um, amazing and long <laughs> and beautiful. Please, you do not have to read the whole thing. <laughs> it's a lot. Okay, well, this is amazing. So we'll, we'll be, the people need to know. Um, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is a marine biologist, policy expert, and writer, and a Brooklyn native. She is the founder of Urban Ocean Lab, which is a think tank for the future of coastal cities. And she is the founder and CEO of Ocean Collective, a consulting firm for conservation solutions. Recently, she co-created um, the Blue New Deal, which is a roadmap for including the ocean in climate policy. <laughs> um, previously, she was the executive director of the Wyatt Institute, developed policy at the EPA and NOAA, served as a leader of the March of Science and taught as an adjunct professor at New York University. Dr. Johnson earned a BA from Harvard University in Environmental Science and Public Policy and a PhD from Scripps Institution of Oceanog Oceanography and Mar in Marine Biology. And she publishes widely, so I highly recommend um, the Washington Post op-ed if you haven't read her Washington Post op-ed, um, following her on social media, um, and really um, getting to also, I think all of us know this because we sent these books out to a bunch of people. Make sure you get your copy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's lovely. It's and powerful and life-changing, really. Oh, so such again. an incredible introduction. Thank you, Rebecca. I have huge respect for the work um, that you're doing, that Fibershed is doing, that that those here are doing, just seeing some of the people introduce themselves um, in the chat. This is such a lovely community. So thank you for inviting me to join you. Thank you for participating with this community. So um, if it's okay, I'm just gonna dive in and ask yeah, some questions. Yeah, ask me anything. Um, all right. So um, the, these questions were based on, I think some of when you were maybe shel more sheltered in place, but I was curious um, if you could share with us today it looks like you might be in Brooklyn, but where you spent a lot of your shelter in place time yeah. and a little bit about your background in that space. I am today in Brooklyn. Um, these are the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, painted by my dad's childhood friend. My dad's Jamaican. My mom's from New York. And for the last 20 years, she's lived upstate um, on a small farm. So 
for the, for I guess probably 80% of the last eight months I've been living with her. And it's a place that I've always visited a lot well, for the last two decades. And it's super special to me because, you know, as a city person, it's so important to reconnect with the cycles of nature. And I've spent a lot of the, the last year going for really long walks in the country and, and appreciating watching the seasons change in a way that I don't normally get to do or don't normally do, I guess. I guess I could, I could have been doing it all along. Um, and, you know, and she is um, a regenerative permaculture farmer. So we've got I'm about wow. 150 chickens um, and this huge vegetable garden and a very young fruit orchard of all sorts of mm. different kinds of trees. And so, you know, helping to weed between conference calls and, um, and feed the chickens and all of that has been really grounding for me this year. And, um, and in particular, just hearing her stories and speaking to farmers there and, and you know, this year, but over the last two decades and, and gaining a deeper understanding of, you know, rural life in general, but also of the challenges that farmers face, um, the economic challenges, just like how hard it is to make a living growing things the way that our economy um, and government is currently set up in the US. So I'm just really grateful for all the time mm -hmm. I get to spend um, up there to, to, to learn about the way the world really works outside of my um, Brooklyn bubble, lovely, lovely a bubble though it may be. <laughs> So in those ex those conversations about some of the social economic pressure yeah. um, that some of her neighbors are facing, I think you had mentioned um, maybe in an interview that um, your mom was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And that yeah, she taught high school English um, in the inner city in New York City for uh, thirty seven years. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Wow, rural life must be quite a, a transition, but a very decompressing in some ways mm -hmm. transition, we would hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that I think you had mentioned something about, yeah, that the neighbors who've been in agricultural practice for some time were facing economic pressures and yeah. yeah it's the, tough. I mean, we have this totally broken system where we subsidize big industrial farming through the farm bill that is really damaging to nature, really heavily, you know, using pesticides and fertilizers. And as a marine biologist, I know where a lot of that ends up is, you know, running into rivers and streams and to the ocean and causing all sorts of ecological problems there. Um, and also just, you know, hearing the stories over the last 20 years of, of how ecosystems have shifted. My mother almost stopped raising chickens because we were, you know, downhill from a cornfield that was using, you know, genetically modified corn and spraying mm. glyphosate, spraying Roundup. And obviously we didn't want that to be um, something that was getting into the, the food that we were producing. Um, we ended up rejiggering mm. a way to like prevent chickens from drinking water out of puddles by like <laughs> planting more stuff between wow. their farm, their, their field and ours so that that was, you know, absorbed Buffer. further away from the barn. But, you know, having to deal with this stuff is obviously a huge pain for farmers who are really trying to do it right because, because it, everything is connected. It really matters what your neighbors are doing. But also Absolutely. just understanding that, you know, the prices that we pay in a farmer's market are way lower than they should be. So that anyone complaining about the cost of a tomato like has no idea what goes into producing that. And, and I, I'm just really yeah. glad that I have some semblance of understanding of, of what goes into, into growing and producing things and how much of a challenge that is because um, you know, in the US we really undervalue food and I'm, I'm sure this, I'm absolutely sure the same goes for fibers because we don't really have an appreciation for what goes into producing them, especially when it's done well and in a, in a way that's ecologically sound. Um, and so I think that, you know, the challenge in a time of recession, when people don't, when people can't afford to be paying the real cost that it, of, of producing these things well, 
um, is, you know, what is the role of policy and what is the role of government? And instead of subsidizing all the bad stuff, instead of dumping, you know, literally tens of billion dollars, billions of dollars into bolstering the fossil fuel economy, as happened in the, um, the COVID recovery package that Congress did pass, um, why are we not instead investing in the transition to a regenerative economy? While we're spending trillions of dollars of taxpayer money, why don't, instead of you know, bailing out these companies that are going bankrupt anyway, why don't we invest in regenerative agriculture and renewable energy? So that's, I think, mm -hmm. one of the biggest <laughs> missed opportunities of 2020 is like the money's there, it's being spent. We're just not prioritizing um, the right things in my opinion. Yes, I was just listening to something like 2.2% of the overall dollars are actually going into like the even the $1,200 check. Like that most of the funds are being usurped at different levels for mm. larger than the family owned or mid-scale business too, larger franchises, larger corporate entities. And so, yeah, it is a complete missed opportunity. Well, yeah. money out of policy. Those who are interested in reading more about that, I was a co-author um, on a letter, a letter to Congress about what a green recovery and a green stimulus would look like. Oh, fantastic. Um, and there's a lot of people who've been doing writing on that, like while we're spending all this money and there's going mm -hmm. to be have to be another round of, of stimulus funding, like what should we be spending that on? Um, and certainly the hope is that with a new administration, those conversations will become easier to have. And where can people look at this writing? Is that um, on your website? Uh, we can also post yes. things. Okay. Yes. Um, ayanaelizabeth.com slash writing has literally everything I've ever published. Um, Sweet. It's a lot, but the titles are all like extremely literal. <laughs> so you'll <laughs> so know. You can skim through and like find like what you might be interested in. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. I, I, right during the shelter in place moment, um, some beautiful, oops, some beautiful um, writing came through around, yeah, what could this transition look like? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, there's a disease as a driver for change. <laughs> it's something I've I mean, been thinking about. It's an inflection about. point, right? Like, yeah. regardless of sort of what it's doing to us as individuals um, and society and our economy and government, like it is undeniably an inflection point. And so the question is, what are we going to do with that? Like, how can we, if need be, sort of like jujitsu that into something that is positive? Um, on an individual level, that can be, I mean, it's, I, I've been very lucky that my work was already pretty remote and yes. independent. Um, and I had signed a few contracts in, in February that kind of made this um, mm. pretty smooth for me, but I realized how exceptional that is. And so I think the opportunity is to focus, you know, to use the freedom that I have as a professional to, to sort of see how far I can push some of these broader public conversations, because I know that most of America right now is just, and, and large parts of the world are just figuring out like how to get by. Yeah, how to eat, how, how to keep the house how warm. Take care of your people, yeah. Yeah, this is, it's a very serious economic situation that I had hoped a recovery bill would have passed by now, but <laughs> oh, if we have to wait till February. Um, but in terms of policy, I was gonna just, you know, ask if you could describe um, some of your foundational experiences when you were um, designing, actually going back to your rootedness in the ocean, um, mm -hmm. the, your, your experience as a practitioner involved in ocean health. And I was reading about your hands-on solution making work and was struck by the balance that you were able to craft between the needs for a fishery to regenerate and for um, the economy of those who are involved in a resource-based economy like fishing and your design of these fish traps and just curious if you could explain that a little bit and sure for listening you know this is how we design policy, right? We think about real lived experience and how we balance the needs of these economic re realities that we live within and the need to keep mm -hmm. communities healthy and well and prosperous while allowing the earth's ecosystems to regenerate. 
And it seems like you kind of like hit the nail on the head in that space. I was hoping you could share more about it. That was, um, that was an amazing thing to get to, to be a part of. So when I was in graduate school, um, I ended up in the Caribbean in Curacao um, having a conversation. I was there just like helping out a friend with her scuba diving research. She needed a dive buddy. Um, and was having a conversation with the fisheries manager on the island. And he was telling me they were thinking about putting new regulations into place. Um, and they were thinking in particular about fish traps um, and ways to reduce the bycatch, the catch of unwanted fish, the, the juvenile fish, the or more ornamental species that don't really have much market value. Um, and he was like, well, we were gonna try to put just like a, a, a slot in the side so they could get out, but we don't actually know that's, that would work because there's been no science on it. Um, and so I was like, okay, I, I could test that out for you. Um, that seems like a great first experiment as a graduate student, you know, like put a hole in the side of a fish trap and like see if they get out. Um, <laughs> but of course, like the science, like the, the rigor of, of science required like four different trap designs in three different locations <laughs> around the coral reef of the island and eight traps at each side and like you know, two of each trap design and then randomizing the order of them every week. And it became like, you know, three or four scuba dives a day for four months. And, you know, it was sort of very taxing physically, um, all to prove that yes, if you put a hole in the side of the trap that <laughs> the small fish will in fact get out, you can reduce um, bycatch by over 80% without affecting fishermen's incomes. And that last step of going around to fish markets, learning the average price for each species, because obviously on a coral reef, you're catching a lot of different things. Um, and being able to do the very simple math per kilo, like, you know, this length of fish weighs this much, how much is the catch worth, um, you know, with and without these slots that to prove that fishermen's um, livelihoods wouldn't be negatively impacted was the reason why um, this trap design was, you know, adopted, required by law in Curacao and then picked up by several other Caribbean islands um, and uh, a scientist, a conservationist who work in East Africa have, you know, learned about this work and are putting it into practice there as well. And I think the lesson there for me is twofold. One is like, when we think of technology, we often think of like very fancy high tech, you know, engineering things that honestly like break and are very resource intensive often. Whereas, you know, I think of this as technology, right? Like redesigning your gear is a technological innovation, is in fact a simple engineering solution. It didn't really cost anything. I just used construction like rebar from the hardware store. Um, a local guy welded that for me into a rectangle that I stuck in the corner. Um, and working with fishermen um, and being able to come up with something really simple. And I just love the pursuit of like really simple, elegant solutions and working like with, um, with the people who are closest to the resource, in this case, the fishermen, um, working with tradition and sort of adapting tradition for the new world that we live in. Um, yeah, I, I loved doing that work. It was maybe the most practical thing I've ever done. <laughs> Um, you know, but the next, the next study that I did was looking at, um, gill nets, which hang vertically in, in the water and, and catch basically whatever swims into them, um, by the gills as the fish try to back out. And it's, there's not a cute solution for that. Right. And mm. some, so sometimes we do have to just let things go. Um, but yeah, I, I loved doing that work. Um, and telling you about it now makes me kind of miss the days when I spent a lot of hours underwater. Mm, I I can relate to the transitions of career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, I understand. Yes, well, so but in terms of delving into that practical experience, um, yeah. like how does that inform your thinking around climate policy today? Or um, it it makes me it it's it's an important reminder as well as all my time on a farm that um, that high tech is not, not the answer, right? Like solar panels and electric cars are useful. We have solar panels on our barn. I drive an electric car. So I'm, I'm into those things, but you know, we need to think more about as, as this convening is like about 
the ocean and about soil as these massive carbon sinks that um, that we need to heal and restore and respect as part of um, as part of the carbon cycle. I mean, I think a lot of times people do not know that the ocean is um, such a major driver of our climate system that the ocean um, has absorbed uh, about 30% of the CO2 we've emitted by burning fossil fuels. Mm. A third of that has gone into the ocean um, and that's changed the chemistry of seawater. That's ocean acidification, right? All this CO2 that gets absorbed by the ocean then sort of has this chemical reaction, becomes carbonic acid, releases hydrogen ions, and it's those ions that drive pH. So we're actually making the ocean more acidic. Mm. Um, and the fact that we've changed the chemistry of seawater of the entire ocean, it's just completely <laughs> bananas to me. And it has all <sighs> these effects, right? Like fish smell through water um, and they can't smell in the same way because we've changed what the water is. They don't smell predators or they don't smell their prey or they don't smell home. Um, oh. and, and it's caused this massive disruption that scientists are only just starting to be able to, um, to tease out and understand. So, um, and, you know, and the ocean has also absorbed about um, over 90% of the heat that we've trapped with greenhouse gases. So just imagine how fried this planet would be if it weren't for the ocean really buffering all of that. And so I think it's just, you know, I find myself often raising my hand on behalf of the ocean and saying like, don't forget the ocean, don't forget the ocean. Um, there was a piece yesterday um, in Bloomberg Green about like 39 mm -hmm. things the Biden administration should do on climate and I was once again like, hey, the ocean. Um, and in, in that particular case, I was talking about um, the opportunities for offshore wind energy, which we are just woefully behind on in the US. I mean, we have 40% of Americans living in coastal counties. And so thinking about energy from the ocean actually is super practical. It can bring energy to people where they are. We have a lot of you know, space in the middle of the country for solar panels and turbines, but that's not where most people are living. Uh, and so making sure we're, you know, we're efficiently producing energy where it's needed um, is something that, that I care a lot about, but. Well, thank you. But yeah. we'll, we will hold up soil and oceans in all of these climate conversations. Absolutely. Stewarding yeah. soil, we need to do a better job of holding up the ocean. Um, in our conversations. So I'm very committed to that. Um, yeah. And just want to keep you don't have to do it all. I mean, what you're doing with <laughs> soil is like more than enough. I think we often have this tendency to like want to each solve everything. And, and oh, I think yeah, it's important a problem. to connect all those dots, like to acknowledge um, the upstream and downstream connections, but I, I certainly wouldn't want people to necessarily leave this conversation thinking, oh gosh, now I have to like fix the ocean too. <laughs> well, um, we can make choices in what we're wearing, you know, like, and it absolutely. doesn't have to be an economically um, insane decision-making process. There's beautiful um, clothing swap, secondhand mm -hmm. options mm -hmm. for accessing natural fibers to reduce plastic smog in the ocean. And yeah, and to stop it's such a powerful term. Yeah, it really is an important way to think about ocean plastic because this idea of like this garbage patch, this island, um, is a total misnomer, right? Um, because it's just there are you know higher densities of plastic in that collect in these currents, these gyres in every ocean basin, but most of the pieces of plastic are like smaller than your pinky fingernail. So it's not something we could just like scoop up a bunch of bottles from the surface. These are small pieces of plastic that degrade in the sun and the salt, become smaller and smaller pieces, and then become part of the food web. And that's um, that's a really big part of the problem, right? And we're dumping about a, a metric ton of plastic into the ocean every four seconds. Um, and so that it's the like sheer quantity um, that's a problem. And, and when, when it comes to the conversation around fibers, it's really um, all of these plastics that you described, um, all of these, you know, lycras, polyesters, synthetic fibers. Every time we, we wash our clothes, those microfibers run, um, run into our waterways and they're so small that they're really hard to, to filter out. I mean, there are options, these like different, um, you know, sort of like balls and filters we can put into our washing machines is one easy thing that we can do. 
um, to, to, and also like making sure that we're not buying synthetic um, fabrics. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I love, I love um, my like guilty pleasure is recycled cashmere sweaters or secondhand oh. cashmere sweaters. Like they my still favorite. work fine. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. A secondhand cashmere sweater. I mean, these things are like the best. I'm so glad it's fall. So, so yeah, I mean, that you're right. That stuff really does matter for, um, you don't have to become an ocean conservationist full time, but the things that we do on land really matter. Yeah, our choices for our second skin um, and recycled cashmere. I vote second that. Um, <laughs> and then I was gonna, you know, in this idea of, you know, what we wear on our second skin, this is such an everyone conversation. Like everyone mm -hmm. engages with their textile life every day. Um, but I wanted to, in this idea of back to policy for a moment, I've been really enjoying um, the How to Save a Planet podcast. So for those of you Thank listening, you. oh, it's awesome. If you haven't um, heard this, this podcast is, there's a few, it, when did it launch? It was pretty It launched in August. I know because it was two days before my 40th birthday. And I was like, well, oh. I got a podcast out before I turned 40. Not that that was like a milestone. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it needs to be met. It's, it's, yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank podcast you. on before 40. <laughs> um, it, it's a really impressive set of, um, it's, a, it's just a series that it had some eye-opening pieces. And one of the, I think it was episode seven that I was going to refer to in this question. Mm -hmm. um, so what I learned from this particular episode was that no major environmental legislation has ever passed without bipartisan support. Um, and I read this was fascinating. You you actually had a quote from Bush, President Bush number one. Um, his quote in that was republished in the podcast, um, his words in quotes. Some say these problems are too big. Some say it's impossible for an individual or even a nation as great as ours to solve the problem of global warming or the loss of forests or the deterioration of our ocean. My response is simple. It can be done. And we must do it. Let's not forget all that we've accomplished since America focused its attention on preserving the environment. And so um, <laughs> I was blown away um, by being- This episode is called um, Making Republicans Environmentalists Again. Yes. And it, the again part is really important, right? Because we, we, if you just look at where we are now, where yeah. like climate denial is basically like the official position of the Republican party. Um, it's, it's easy to sort of forget that that wasn't always the case that, you know, president Nixon created the environmental protection agency, signed the clean water act, clean air act. There's an, there's a quote in that same episode where he says like, send me more legislation and I'll sign it. Like, why are you holding it up in Congress? Oh, um, and those were the days <laughs> those were weirdly right. Um, and so there's this amazing opportunity. I mean, it was only, um, and, and, and John McCain ran on um, a very strong climate platform when he was running for president um, in just 2008. So it's only in the last 12 years with the, um, with the you know, rise of the Tea Party, um, which was funded by the Koch brothers and oil and gas in the interests um, that we had this transition to Republicans being um, the part, the part, the party of climate denial. Um, and so when I think about like, we only need a time machine to go back like 12 years, we don't even need to go back that far. Um, and so reminding people that like, we actually, when we take the words out, um, something that came out since that episode is polling that Fox news did of their own viewers about their concerns, um, around climate and 70% of the, the Fox News viewers said that they were concerned about climate change. And 70% said they would like oh. the government to invest more in, um, in clean and green energy, Wonderful. right? So when we take out the words global warming, when we take out the term Green New Deal, um, like people want renewable energy. They realize that that's the way we're going. They want those jobs locally. Um, people want those opportunities. Um, people want clean air and clean water, right? Like yes. when we break it down, there's actually very strong agreement. And of course, 
you know, the Green New Deal became a very polarizing term, you know, on the flip side, because of Fox News, because they slammed it, because right when it was released, it had strong bipartisan support from mm -hmm. voters. Um, what was happening in Congress was a whole different, like, political ballgame. But, you know, Americans now are like, that sounds good. A Green yes. New Deal where we were like, green jobs and the economy, but also protecting nature, like, I'm in. And most people haven't read it. So I would just say for those who mm. are curious, like what it even says, it's 13 pages, double spaced, large font. It'll take <laughs> you like five minutes to read it. It's, um, you know, we think of obviously, it's not legislation, it's a resolution. So it's really a vision statement. And, mm. and there are some statements about agriculture and supporting family farms. And so I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, because these are things we can advocate for, right? Like now that it's in the resolution, we can say like, well, remember when you said, and it has, you know, 101 co-sponsors in the house and it had, um, you know, two dozen co-sponsors in the Senate. So these are all people who have signed on to regenerative agriculture being important. Wow, wow. So, um, oh, I see that we have five minute warning. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, there's so much to say, but thank you for um, for bringing up the show. We actually have an episode. We have two episodes. I think two, at least our, we have one that's already in edits um, on agriculture. Um, and so stay tuned for that. I think it's coming out not until January on regenerative agriculture. We interviewed farmers about their transition in their practices. Um, our episode today is about electric cars, in case people are wondering, like, what is, what is actually the deal? Um, that's, that's today's episode. So, oh, so yeah. wonderful. I can't wait to hear about electric cars. And we've got one coming up on plastics um, as well, I think in December, um, and one wow. on nuclear. So, so yeah, I mean, all of these things that I've had questions about, but now that we have this incredible team of serious journalists who can get to the bottom of all these things. It's been great for me because I'm like, what's the deal with nuclear? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I have, um, I'm grateful for all that I've learned on this. And also just for people to, if they haven't, um, the author of the Green New Deal language is, is featured in one of, in this anthology. Yeah, gone right. She's incredible. And she writes about And her... she wrote it when she was like 29. She's, you know, a black woman from the south side of Chicago. She's a Rhodes Scholar. She's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And she's, she connects the dots so well between environmental issues and justice issues um, and policy as, um, as, as, a, as a commitment to a specific vision of the future. It's, it's it, remarkable. And that, and that also you had, um, is it Colette? Pichon uh, Battle. Pichon mm -hmm. Battle. She's also featured in the book. And I just um, wanted to um, point to her work too in the South, uh, well, in the Gulf, really, because we're mm -hmm. about to go into a transition around the plastic flow and some representatives mm -hmm. who are representing um, kind of a defiant relationship with Formosa Plastics, for instance. Um, and I was just so impressed by the way these grassroots organizers spoke about their work in All You Can Save, thinking about, or All We Can Save, um, about their relationship with their community. And mm -hmm. they are able to deconstruct so much of the rhetoric and the language that we see thrown around in the media and just talk about like who they work with in their community and what rural communities need, what urban communities need, and just growing the, the work from the needs of the people and it was so beautiful that women are so, it seems in this beautiful way, able to nurture communities in distress and stick by them. Mm -hmm. I think you write about that in the introduction that yeah. through the fires, through the floods, <clears throat> through the plastic contamination, through the pressures that monolithic industry wants to place um, on our community by limiting our access to things and telling politicians how to design policy there's this percolation from with communities upward that I just love mm -hmm. that you captured. So yeah. thank you for thank that you. anthology. <laughs> yeah, for people who aren't familiar with the book. Oh, actually, let me grab yeah, my please. coffee. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with it, I think the most exciting about it is the back cover. 
oh, which yes. lists all the contributors instead of blurbs from famous people. We really just wanted to highlight all of the work that's in here. Um, 41 essays, 17 poems, um, a bunch of stunning original illustrations. Um, and the goal is to show the full spectrum of ways that you can be a part of climate solutions. And so, you know, to get away from this, you know, solar panels, electric cars, like high tech thing, um, yeah. there's a beautiful essay by, um, by Leah Penniman, um, who is a farmer who writes about um, farming and justice. She's a black woman who farms mm. upstate New York. Soul there's, Fire um, Farm, yeah. Yeah, Soul Fire Farm. Um, and there's an essay by Emily Stengel, who's co-founder of an organization called Green Wave about seaweed farming. I feel like seaweed is the future. I hope we can figure out how to make clothes out of seaweed. Um, and uh, there's maybe, um, if you'll indulge me, I think there's a few sentences from the end that might be a good yeah. way to wrap up. We're gonna take questions for, I think, uh, we'll take two questions for seven minutes. Okay, so yeah, perfect, great. perfect, let's do That's it. Perfect. <laughs> let's read. Oh no, go um, ahead, yeah. We'll read Let's first. do the questions first and I'll pick, I'll pick the exact right. Thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, I have 20 minutes for questions. Oh, oh awesome. no. Wow. Okay. Um, so we are going to let those, okay, here we go. People voted on the questions. So this um, is a question about, I'm curious to learn more about seawater infiltration in our groundwater. Um, as someone living in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and how farmers and ranchers can help mitigate the challenges presented by this challenge. We actually, where we have our symposium every year, there was this year a massive saltwater intrusion into the wells mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. lost access to our drinking water in Point Reyes. And so I, I'm wondering if maybe this is that person. And mm. um, I will just say that I also wish we were all out there eating oysters and looking at nature. It is like <laughs> such a magical part of the world. Um, I'm mm. so glad that I've had the chance to visit. I'm, I used to live very briefly in the Bay Area and made a few trips there. Um, we look forward to hosting you one time. One allows. day, I'm in. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think the challenge is water management is like a whole can of worms. Um, but yeah. I, we, we sort of have to like be more realistic in our expectations of nature um, is to me the big thing, right? Like we expect endless fresh water to just pump out of the ground. Um, and mm. when, we, when we drain it, and it often takes, you know, thousands of years for aquifers to recharge, to refill, right? Because that water slowly, slowly percolates through the soil and through the rocks to refill those water sources. And so it's, to me, it's the same thing as overfishing. Like, are we catching fish faster than they can make babies? Mm. Yes, in almost every case, right? Um, are we drawing water out of aquifers faster than it can replenish? And the answer is yes. And that creates this pressure um, sort of vacuum where then like something else gets sucked into that empty space underground. Um, and often that is seawater. And so you could have um, saltwater intrusion. And we know that, you know, watering your fields with salt water is like not a great thing. And so one of the things that people are thinking about is how to, you know, interbreed or crossbreed crops to make them more um, salt tolerant um, or in cases like identify varieties that already are more salt tolerant certainly um, those exist I mean leaning into the diversity um, that already exists within different um, crops is going to be really important as the world continues to change so quickly um, yeah. the heat tolerant varietals and the salt tolerant varietals are going to become things that we need to um, be using more and more. Um, and compost, we can mitigate com salinity with composting. Compost. Yes, absolutely. With um, and also thinking about how we manage the rain that falls from the sky, right? Like we don't yes. need to keep pulling all of the water out of aquifers. We could think about how to better manage um, rain 
rainfall, which was, is also an opportunity for better um, managing and limiting erosion of topsoil, which is another huge issue. Um, so I don't have like the answer. Oh, to, it's so site you know, specific to too. Salt you know. water intrusion problems. But you know, one of them is certainly to rely, to figure out if there are ways we can rely less on groundwater um, and better manage um, rainwater. And you know, the way that my mother does that is through this permaculture techniques of, of um, you know, when you have a slope using berm and swale um, to retain water for longer. We've had like, I mean, the facts <laughs> of climate change are that we have like more dry, more like more drought and more flood. Um, and so to see after a crazy rainstorm, these, these like swales just like full, like two feet of water. Wow. <laughs> that like slowly over the course of the next week or two, like seep down into the soil, right? As opposed to like washing everything away. It's a, just a total game changer. And the way that we, like the way that you mulch to keep, keep the soils moist, right? Instead of needing to constantly water. I mean, there's a lot of these, agricultural techniques to reduce the need for groundwater. And I would love to see more and more farmers um, adopt those practices. And it seems like your, your list of collaborators, I'm sure are, are on top of it. Well, tomorrow there's, um, for the person who asked that question, uh, Dr. Cindy Daly, uh, Dr. Lori Flint um, from USGS, they'll be talking a lot about the connection between soil organic carbon and, and water. And Great. we know that we can mitigate the climate water deficit, which is a term that'll get defined tomorrow by increasing the health of the soil and its ability to hold water during a rain event, which is what the Berman swale uh, strategy does and the actual soil texture in the soil. Mm -hmm. If you can change its texture through enhancing soil biology <laughs> you can create these there's little a, air pockets um, yeah absolutely yes and i there's a great essay um there's a whole section in in um all we can say is called nourish that really mm -hmm. is about okay. agriculture and the food system and there's um there's an essay by a soil scientist called solutions underfoot that talks about soil carbon and microbes in soil so if you want to nerd out about soil we've got you covered on that too <laughs> um, and there's an essay called water is a verb by judith schwartz mm. that talks about the role of water in in the in the climate system in the um and she has an entire book um uh about this, um, that's phenomenal. So for those who want to learn more about, um, about the role of water um, more broadly, um, yeah, check out Judith Schwartz's work. She's incredible. She is, and um, we, yeah, she's someone who actually wanted to in, engage into this. Next time. Next time. I'm sure she would say yes, she's a gem. Um, she, and so my mother, wrote a poem in the book called oh. Notes from a Climate Victory Garden. Um, she is completely enamored with this concept of victory gardens from World War II and how we might bring those back as part of our climate solution. So um, I woke up one morning um, this spring at the farm and you know sat at the breakfast table with her and she sort of sheepishly pushed across the table this poem she had written the night before. Oh. <laughs> um, and it made the cut. Yeah. I had to sort of like take myself out of the decision making for that and Dr. Catherine Wilkinson, my co-editor, was like, no, no, this is good enough. <laughs> to That's make it into the powerful. Uh, yeah, that to have, um, yeah, mother-daughter collaboration uh, infused so she and i have book. actually written two pieces for scientific american as well on um soil and seaweed um and in sort of the carbon cycle and one on um on sort of like on, on microbes and, and and regenerative farming can we read those two on the website yeah yeah i can drop okay. those links in here um, and thank you to the person who added the link to do the schwartz work yeah, and to the person yeah. who said the book is out of order, um, there is a supply chain problem in part because of COVID and in part because <laughs> we insisted on printing the book on 100% recycled paper. Um, and apparently Thank like, you. that went out of stock. And so we're reprinting 
a bunch more books now. So um, I know Amazon is not not what the cool kids are using. I avoid it too. Um, it is in stock there um, and it is in stock in a bunch of places, but not everywhere. But please keep ordering it even if it's taking a while to get to you. We, um, the, the fact that a climate book is has made the bestseller list is a very big deal, especially an anthology because um, uh, anthologies typically don't sell well because of the cult of the individual in America. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we can do is support the chorus of voices, right? Like Rebecca, your work is so collaborative and we all need to learn from each other. Um, and so to me, this is like a, putting forward not just information, but a particular vision of the future where we're not looking to one hero or one leader, but um, but acknowledging that the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. The answer to that is lots of leaders, lots yes. of women, lots of people of color, um, sort of diversifying in every sense of the word. I mean, we were so careful about the geographic diversity of the authors of the book, the age diversity of the, you know, the essayist included. Um, and so, yes, to the person who said the audiobook is good, we have this like star studded cast of like Julia Louis Dreyfus and Sophia Bush and Alana Glazer and Janet Mock and Alfre Woodard and Alana Glazer. It's just, it's very well read oh, <laughs> and you. super fun. Do you, and we have time for one more question too, I think, yeah. from the audience. Um, can you explain to us the functions of the mechanism of ocean currents as a carbon pump and fish poo as carbon digester? Sylvia Earle warned um, at an ocean summit in 2012 that in 10 years, um, it might be too late to make a shift. Your thoughts? So um, the ocean uh, is currently absorbing about a third of the carbon that we emit by burning fossil fuels. Um, that All that CO2 is going into the ocean, it's changing the chemistry of seawater. Um, and there's only so much the ocean can absorb, right? There is a saturation point. Um, and so when it comes to carbon cycle in the ocean, the question is like, you know, we, we know there's this interface between the atmosphere and the ocean, and that's where that absorption is happening. Um, but what happens in the deep ocean? Um, yeah. And so the, the way that large ocean currents work is they don't just go around the surface, they also go sort of like, like this, sort of mm. down into the ocean. So. For example, the current in the North Atlantic comes up from the Caribbean. Um, so it pulls warm water up from the Caribbean in the Gulf Stream, goes up past Maine and around to Europe. Um, and that warmer, saltier water, um, because of all the evaporation, the Caribbean water is actually a bit saltier. And so as that goes north, um, it, that's the reason why Europe is warmer than it should be given its um, latitude. Um, and when that when the current gets up there, the water obviously gets colder and colder um, salty water is more dense. So that starts to sink um, mm. and that sinking sort of like drives the current right um, and pulls it down. But what we're seeing because of all the ice melting and, and it pulls carbon down with it too. And some of that carbon can get sequestered in the deep sea for thousands of years. Um, but what we're seeing with the water ice melting um, is that, you know, the salt, the, the ocean isn't as salty as it used to be up there um, because of all the ice melting from Greenland um, mm. is making the water less salty. So you don't have that salinity and temperature gradient as strong as it used to be. So that whole current is sort of slowing down, which is terrifying because that drives so much of the, um, so many of the weather patterns that we've grown accustomed to, right? The fact that it doesn't really snow in Ireland, even though it's pretty far north. Um, I heard that that might threaten certain potentials of ice age, like in places like New York up, if the Gulf Stream really does start to slow down or mm -hmm. halt, um, is that something that rings true in terms of the, the kind of dramatic effect of Gulf Stream slow down? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is like, we don't really know exactly what's gonna happen. Um, and I think, you know, in, I, I'm, I'm actually not up on all the scientific details of the latest projections there. So I would not wanna say something um, inc incorrect, but I would zoom out and say, 
the important part of this is to acknowledge that dramatic changes that are not going to be pleasant are on the way. And, and the question is, what are we going to do to mitigate those, um, to adapt to those, but also to prevent as much of it as possible, right? We still have, have time. every time I look at one of these graphs of scientific, scientific projections, the scientists are, are correct about the direction things are going, right? But what, but what they can't predict is what we are going to do in the next decade that could make things better. So all these graphs sort of have this error bar around it. Um, um, and that and that unknown, that uncertainty is what will we do? Mm. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that as as much as a lot of these quite dramatic ecological physical changes are happening, um, we still do get to write what the future looks like to a certain degree. And we need to make sure that we are are taking up that opportunity. Mm. And so in terms of writing what the future would look like, do you want to describe a bit about the Blue New Deal for us and your contribution sure. to that powerful sure. document? So um, as discussed, um, I, you know, I read the Green New Deal resolution, which I would encourage you all to do. Um, and as I was reading it, I was really excited to see the mentions of agriculture in there, but I was really disappointed to see how little the ocean was mentioned. The mm. ocean gets like a passing mention on page 10. It's like, in a list of things we should protect. It's like, oh, and the mm. ocean. Um, and I'm like, ah, if we don't think about the ocean in a more integral way, like we're just not gonna get there, right? We are going yeah. to be leaving a lot of key solutions on the table, um, especially offshore renewable energy. I mean, floating solar panels are a thing now. Um, and of course we need to think about wind turbines and solar panels and you know, tidal um, energy really responsibly as far as where we're putting those things to minimize um, ecological impacts and obviously not put them in migratory pathways of different marine species, et cetera. Um, but we, but we need to, do, we need to charge ahead responsibly. Um, and so when I read it, um, I had the same reaction as a lot of other ocean scientists and policy nerds, which is like, there's a big blue gap in the Green New Deal. <laughs> so I co-authored an op-ed with that title um, with Bren Smith, who's a regenerative yeah. ocean farmer. Um, cool. And his his partner, his co-founder Emily, has an essay in our book, um, and and with Chad Nelson, who's the CEO of Surfrider, which is the largest grassroots ocean conservation group in the U.S. And we put our heads together and said, like, this is what it would look like if we included the ocean in, in a Green New Deal. It would look like renewable offshore energy. It would look like protecting and restoring ecosystems. It would look like um, regenerative farming of the ocean and making sure you know ocean agriculture gets the same support that land agriculture does. It would look like training people for these blue, blue jobs. It would look like um, uh, changing the way that we do shipping and our ports and making mm -hmm. shipping is a huge, um, has a huge carbon footprint. It is, um, if shipping were, mm -hmm. you know, compared to countries, it would be like the sixth, fifth or sixth largest emitting wow. nation. It's massive so um, because export. of the types of fuels. Mm -hmm. so the, that, that, the, wow, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the types of fuels they use tend to be much dirtier. There's a lot of innovation happening there, but there's a long way to go. Um, and so uh, we put that out into the world and, and ocean people were like, right, exactly. And then we ended up working with this think tank called Data for Progress uh, on a, a policy memo specifically on the jobs aspect of that. Um, and then um, Bren, uh, uh, asked during the CNN Climate Down Hall, um, you know, asked, <laughs> he submitted a video question and I'm watching this town hall with a bunch of my friends um, in Brooklyn, must have been like in January when we were still hanging out in each other's living rooms and he comes on the screen and I just jump up <laughs> and start yelling, that's Brent Smith, he's a fisherman and a farmer and I know him. <laughs> <laughs> and he asked the question happened to be directed to elizabeth warren and he said like what about a blue new deal like we're leaving out all of these solutions and we're not protecting the ocean economy and people like me who make a living off the sea mm -hmm. and she immediately was like absolutely we should have a blue new deal and and then a week later i got a call from her policy staff like so apparently we're making a blue new deal <laughs> But that responsiveness, I, like I mean, the responsiveness I know. of her to Bren, who, you know, he I has, it. it's, 
brilliant. So in that the opportunity, politicians should be that like response, this, right? Like, oh yeah, sure. We should absolutely. I mean, and from Massachusetts, I think she got that a lot more intuitively than politicians from other places might have because they have such a strong history of fishing and that's a really big um, part of their economy, but also just like loud voices in politics. Fishermen there are very powerful voices. Um, and so, yeah, so it became, became the Blue New Deal plan. And then I had the chance to talk to the Biden policy team and make sure some of those ideas got carried forward. And so I, I will be continuing to advocate for that as, um, as this new administration comes in because because that is just so needed. And so I think for me, the lesson here is just to sort of speak up when you see these things, right? When you see these mm. gaps, which are really opportunities to like to raise your hand and say like, hey, we missed something here. Um, because it's not like the people who wrote the Green New Deal resolution don't care about the ocean. That's right. Or don't care about these climate solutions. It's that not everyone was in the room when that was written. And so these, you know, People are like, should we have a blue new deal or a green new deal? I'm like, both. <laughs> That's right. Obviously, they're complementary. They're not in conflict um, at all. And so, in terms of you know, in the work that we see with rural communities who are who are named in the green new deal, that mm -hmm. um, communities that are losing their population um, and and the great migration to cities that there's a real embrace of rural communities. And yet we see often this political divide show up in somewhat distinct ways, depending between a rural and urban populace. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, you know, this idea that you put forward in one of the episodes of How to Save a Planet, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think you responded to um, a question about how we deal with, um, systemic racism and climate change you know we gotta we gotta do we gotta in, include a number of voices who may not be able to use all their creative energy all the time to think about climate change and I notice in rural communities actually some of the same thing just the ability just to be able to get to a hospital hours and hours mm -hmm. away or to be able to have access to um you know, not the glyphosate, not what the farm bill is pushing, but actually pioneer um, a way of doing ag that might cost more, but it's actually nature-based solutions they're trying to engage. Um, I was just curious if you have any words about, hmm. because you live in an urban in, and a rural community and you straddle that, um, you know, what are, what are the ways or the language or the feelings you have about bringing people together around again, these resource-based economies, a fishery, a farming community, a ranching community, where do we all share ground? How do we, how do we have all of our voices respecting one another as we build policies for all of our future? Um, this is such a good question. Um, this is gonna sound very cliche, but I think the answer just starts with respect. I think, you know, having the opportunity to, to see, you know, both urban and rural, mm -hmm. I think there's a dismissal that happens on both sides, right? Um, you know, urban folks tend to dismiss rural people as un unintelligent or uninformed or um, that they just don't get it. Um, mm -hmm. And and honestly, rural folks say a lot of the same things. Like they're out of, these city people are out of touch. They don't understand like what's actually happening out in the world. Um, and they're all, all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, That's and right. so I think, um, you know, starting and, and, and as we sort of touched on earlier, a lot of the debate around environmental issues comes from like rural people not wanting to be told what to do by city people who have no clue what the soil feels like. Right. And that is legit. Like, don't, don't just go around on your high horse telling me what to do and like you have no idea what it's like to be a farmer um you, you know you don't you come here telling me what chemicals i can and cannot use or what practices i should use and so i think the work that you're doing um that fiber shed is doing that that um the broader sort of regenerative community is doing where farmers can be in conversation with each other is really valuable so that these 
it's not coming from like some out of touch urban person who's like, I read this article and like, you guys should all be farming regeneratively, what's wrong with you? Um, oh gosh, I've seen like, that. Let's happen. not do that. Let's not do that. Um, I think the opportunity though is to, to listen. I think if we start with, with curiosity and questions as opposed to offering unsolicited advice, <laughs> it's the same as like approaching any topic, right? Like, well, you know, why do you do it this way? And, um, you know, have you tried other things? And, you know, like, what are the economic constraints? And like, what are the reasons that you're not, you know, and, and not in like an interrogation, but like, if we approach these conversations with an honest curiosity about why people think a certain way or why people are using certain practices. This is something that I, um, you know, we talked about my work with fish traps, but what I didn't mention was I had been, like that was basically the last field biology work that I did. I then immediately was like, what I need to do is understand fishermen, not understand mm. fish. The fish are doing all, everything right, right? Like the seeds are doing everything right. They're trying their best to live. The fish are trying their best, you know, to, to eat and not get eaten and make babies and all of these things. And so what I did was then spend three months driving around the island with, you know, folding chairs and snacks and a cooler full of beer in my trunk, interrupting dominoes games and hanging out at fishing docks and saying like, you tell me, you've been on the water, under the water for your whole life. In fact, for generations. So you have this like a lot of information that I will never ever know. Like, will you share with me some of your knowledge? Mm. And will you tell me if you could write the rules to manage fishing, what would they be? What do, what do you think would, would work better than this? Um, and I learned, and I, I, I didn't share my opinion. I just listened for hundreds and hundreds of interviews over the course of months. And it was one of the most transformational periods of my life because it's so easy to think that people who are doing things that we look to and say like, well, that's unsustainable. Why are they doing that way? Um, it's more complicated than that, right? Like there are actual reasons. Um, and I think that is, that is a real opportunity to, to have the, I mean, and, and the, the, the frustrating part is that like, this <laughs> is inevitably time consuming. This is the long game, right? Like this is like the deep conversations that are often awkward, but there's no way around it because you can't just like tell someone else what to do. And they're like, all oh, right, I never thought of that. Like that's just never going to be how it goes. Um, and I think having some, some grace for people as, as, they, um, as they figure out how to align their values, which inevitably people do want, you know, clean air and clean water and a safe future for their families and for everyone. Like helping, like having, offering people some grace as we figure out how to get there, I think. Um, and, and approaching this as a way, uh, from a perspective of welcoming people in. All of my work right now, the book, the podcast, you know, all of it is like, how, how do we welcome more and more people into the work that needs doing? Because that's what we need, right? We need to build, the biggest team ever of people working on climate solutions and help everyone figure out like where they fit in. So um, the biggest team to solve the biggest problem. I think yeah. you said that in um, one of the podcasts. And so listening, respect, grace. Thank yeah, you. Don't be a jerk. I mean, this is like <laughs> really, do we need, do we need a, a fireside chat to tell you like not to be a jerk? No, but. <laughs> Well, maybe, you know, it's got a little rough out there. Um, <laughs> it's got a little rough out there. Um, so do you want to maybe share with us the statement in the end of the book or yeah, yeah before I'm we wrap up? You. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the last essay in the book um, and the first are co-authored by me and Dr. Catherine Wilkinson, my co-editor. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was really hard to name the book because you know it's an anthology it's all over the map in terms of topics um and um i'll i'll come back and and share the few lines of a poem that inspired the title but the the last essay in the book is called onward and it and it has mm. a paragraph about each of the words in the title all we can save and the 
subtitle to me is really important to truth, courage, and solutions for the climate crisis, because that is the trifecta that we need, right? Like we need to face the facts. Like yes. there's some bad stuff that's coming and we, we can't sort of sugarcoat that. And we need to right. move forward with courage in the face of all of this knowledge um, and focus on solutions and not get bogged down in, in, um, in all the rest. So, um, mm -hmm. so I think for this moment, because of the way that you approach your work um, as this collective, um, I, I would like to share the paragraph about we um, by way of closing. Thank you. Um, we speaks to the collective, to collaboration, to community, to the relational work at hand. Addressing the climate crisis, the gnarliest problem humanity has faced will take everyone. That has to include girls and women, that has to include you, that has to include not just leaders, but followers, doers, makers, and nurturers of all stripes in true cooperation. Mm. The climate movement is now three generations deep. <laughs> so much sage advice and youthful energy to harness such diverse expertise and perspectives to bring to bear. We must hold this broad collectivism tightly mm -hmm. to ensure poor communities, communities of color and indigenous peoples are not just included, but at the heart of this transformation. Lest we have a fractured and incomplete we. We speaks to justice, to how we do the work that needs doing and whose contributions are valued. We cannot, we must not go it alone. To focus only on what we can do as individuals instead of what we can do together will mean failure. A theme that emerges strongly in this book is community. Indeed, building community around solutions is the most important thing. Um, and that is my, my personal mantra I was so glad Catherine let me get away with sneaking that in, that <laughs> building community around solutions is the most important thing. And I can show you, um, welcome to my living room, um, that this <clears throat> art on the wall is the word community um, that my friend Reggie Black, an artist, wrote for me because I wanted to see that word oh, um, every day. Um, building so, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so the very last thing that I'll share is is the the the... Um, the stanza from this Adrian Rich poem called Natural Resources that inspired the title for the book. And I will try to get through it without crying. It is just six lines. <laughs> oh, me <laughs> too. Sort of okay. gets me every time. <laughs> um, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with, that, with those who age mm. after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world and mm. and that is what this work is about that you Rebecca are shepherding this reconstitution of the world mm. against the odds so thank you thank you thank you for all thank of you, you. and thank everyone you. are doing um it really means a lot to get to be a part of this gathering with you mm. our community thanks you I thank you <laughs> I tried to get through the six lines without crying. Not, not, not unsuccessful. I read it fast to try not to tear up, but like that's sort of counter to the point. Oh, thank you. Um, this was beautiful time with you. And I look forward to more time as we develop, co-develop this version of true democratic influence over policy from all mm. corners the ocean and the soil, these, these voices of, of land stewards and sea stewards. Um, I so look forward to the collaborations to bring those voices into shaping the policies that will allow us to subsist and thrive yeah. here yeah. together. We gotta change the rules of the game if we're gonna win. <laughs> Absolutely. Part of, the, part of the challenge. Have um, a beautiful well, rest you. of your day. Thank you. Likewise, <laughs> enjoy your whole conference, everyone. It's gonna be such a series of treats for you. Oh, we're so grateful you kicked oh, us just off. Oh, one yeah. last thing. Someone wrote that there's um, about, there's a book club for All We Can Save. Someone oh, asked yeah. about that. There are resources um, for that. If you want to have group discussions, um, my co-editor, Catherine, created something called All We Can Save Circles. 
I just dropped the link in. There's a set of questions for each section of the book. There are more resources about the work of all of the essayists. There are um, all sorts of prompts if you want to be um, reading this book um, with other people. And I highly recommend reading it with other people because you're going to get fired up on this. You're going to want to chat about it. <laughs> you're going to want to chat about it and you're going to want to get together in community and, and work together because it's so inspiring to see what women have already done in their communities successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't even get to all that, but this was brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right take care. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye.